you are listening to the Atlanta Sports Podcast, the only podcast covering all of your teams. Bringing you the best sports news from the state of Georgia, from the professional ranks to the high school levels, we have it all. Welcome back to the Atlanta Sports Podcast. I am Luke Winstall here with Frankie Maloof. We are glad to have you with us. We'd like to thank you for finding us on our website, atlantasportspodcast.com, on our Twitter account, at ATL Sportscasts, or also iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you found us. Thank you. If you like the episode, please share it with your friends if they're interested in Atlanta sports. Again, we'd like to increase our audience, and we'd love if you can help us with that. So, again, we're glad to have you, and we'll start off with some good news. We're doing our Falcons episode today. So the good news, the biggest piece of good news is Julio Jones is going to be back. He is the NFL's leading receiver, even though he sat out the last two games. He's being trailed by T.Y. Hilton and Antonio Brown in that race for the NFL's leading receiver in terms of yards. So Julio hopes to come back and increase his lead. Had a great game against the Carolina Panthers earlier this year. So he hopes to have an even better one, if that's even possible, this week. Also, the other good news, Adrian Claiborne, the defensive lineman, back in practice and will play Saturday. His four and a half sacks on the season looks to get even more if he possibly can. He's done a nice job filling in on that defensive line. And Jalen Collins will also play this Saturday versus the Panthers. And with the secondary being weaker without Desmond Trufant, it's nice to have another body back there. Yeah, and that defense is gotten some much needed depth back on the defensive line eight with Adrian Claiborne. The pass rush has been much better. Claiborne's added four and a half sacks this year. Vic Beasley's the leading pass rusher in the NFL. I think that this can't hurt it at all. Adrian Claiborne's a good football player. It's nice to know that the Falcons have a little bit more depth for the end of the game as they're trying to get into the playoffs now, especially on the defensive front. And also Jalen Collins at cornerback after the Desmond Trufant injury, like you said, the Falcons secondary has been possibly the weakest part of the team, and it's nice to have more depth as they get into the playoffs now. Nice to know that he's back. And then Julio Jones, you know, it's the Falcons scored 40 or more points in both of the last two games without Julio Jones. Now, granted, they're against two of the weaker defenses in the NFL, in the Rams and the 49ers, but it's nice to know this offense can function without him, although he is the best receiver in the NFL. Yeah, it's really nice to have them back. Some guys that the Falcons will not have, unfortunately. Austin Hooper, the rookie tight end, he is out for this week for sure. It's not going to be a long-term injury that he has. I believe it's a knee injury, but it's just going to be kind of a precautionary move to keep him out of this game. Smart decision. It's, you know, the playoff not completely on the line. It's just really the seeding here. Also, the Falcons hoping to clinch, so I'd rather them rest Hooper a little bit and get him back to full strength without risking any more injury. And Devondre Campbell will definitely not play this week. He is under the concussion protocol. So we wish him the best as he goes through that series of head injury clearance and everything, trying to get him through that so he can come back. Campbell is a rookie linebacker. We drafted him in the fourth round of this year's draft and played a nice game. You know, he's done a good job overall, but... Unfortunately, he's had a hard time with injuries this year, but I'm really looking forward to having him back on the field as soon as possible. Yep, and hopefully he'll be able to come back this year for the playoffs and potentially their run to the Super Bowl. But Luke Keekley, the Panthers linebacker, has been out for a long time, the past three or four games with it. He's been in concussion protocol as well. So this could be a long process and potentially the end of he could be out for the season, depending on how long the Falcons season continues. And then also the Falcons brought back Deshaun Goldson. He's the hard hitting safety. He played four games with one tackle for the Falcons in twenty sixteen. And they also signed wide receiver BJ Daniels, the former dual threat quarterback. He met our coaches when he was in Seattle in twenty thirteen. We signed him to the practice squad. And then we also waived the preseason sensation JD McKissick. Yeah, again, we're getting some bodies back, like we said, for our playoff run. Lost a few, but the Falcons brought back Deshaun Goldston, another guy that played with the team. Like you said, not a whole lot of production in the four games he appeared in so far this season, but it's good to have him. He's a big-time leadership guy, one of the best leaders in the NFL, from what I've heard. And B.J. Daniels, I don't think very much of, but it's fine to have him 
on the practice squad just as another really fast guy that they could potentially bring up if someone were to get hurt. And J.D. McKissick, I'm disappointed they waived him, but hopefully he'll clear waivers and be able to get back with the team on a practice squad or something like that. I'd like to see him keep developing just because he's very fast. I liked his style of play and the way he plays. So hopefully he'll be able to return to Atlanta because I think he has some good potential, especially as a returner now that Eric Weems is getting older and may not have much more of a future with our Falcons. J.D. McKissick might be able to come in and at least compete for that return, return spot. You know, I'm not sure what the popular opinion is on McKissick, but my own opinion and, and impression of him is very good. So the Falcons are the number one offense in the NFL. They're the only team in the NFL averaging over 30 points per game. They've had five games over 40 points per game so far this season. One of them was against Carolina earlier this season when they threw up 48 but Frankie, you, you wrote an article before the season started about how this offense can succeed and what they need to do. But did you see the level of success coming? Well, you know, I did see this team, like I mentioned in the article, I did see this team having a very successful offense. Now, I'm not sure I saw them coming up with all these records for the most points per game the, the Falcons have ever had. But all the pieces were there to begin with. They finally signed Alex Mack, and they had a great offensive line, something Matt Ryan's been missing for a long time, protection. They also have Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman, who both are seasoned a little bit more this year. They both had pretty good seasons last year. And then the wide receivers, they had Julio Jones, the best receiver in the NFL. And then they signed Mohamed Sanu over the offseason. That was a big addition because now opposing teams have to watch both receivers as well. And then there have been surprises this year. Justin Hardy's been doing better. Tate Gabriel, he's been the surprise of the year. The biggest waiver claim I think the Falcons have gotten this year. That was a major surprise, and I think that's really helped out. But just balance, I think, has helped this team. And no, I did not see them scoring this many points per game and being this successful, but I'll take it. Yeah, it's awesome to have the Falcons having so great of a season, especially offensively. You know, before the season, personally, I think I even said it on the show, I would have liked to see the team fire Kyle Shanahan, but now, you know, I was I was wrong with that one. Shanahan, having a great year, moved up to the press box to call some plays, and he's done a great job. He's done a nice job adapting to the team that he has and not forcing his system as much. So credit to him. I'm really, to be honest with you, surprised what he's been able to do, but he's got great pieces, and he's worked around them very well. Some other roster moves that just came across yesterday, the Falcons waived defensive lineman Malachi Goodman and safety Robinson Therese. They also promoted linebacker Josh Keyes and tight end DJ Tia Labia to the active roster. So just something notable, maybe something with Thomas Dimitrov there is Malachi Goodman was a fourth round pick of the Falcons back in 2013 they're cutting him just three years later, so another draft pick for Dimitrov that didn't work out back in the Mike Smith era, but now that Dan Quinn's taken over and he's worked with Dimitrov, it seems like you know Dan Quinn's fourth-round picks from the past two years are not going to get cut like Goodman did. So maybe something, something has changed with the drafting process, and I want to make a note of that just to come back to in April or May to just trust the picks that Dan Quinn's making because Dimitrov didn't do a great job with Mike Smith, but now they've really turned it around. Yeah, I think those two guys work well together. I think that they're finally you know, putting a vision together, and it's working. The pass rush is finally improving. Everything is doing well, so I trust them. I think that they're going to do a great job. But hopefully we have the 32nd pick in next year's draft because we won the Super Bowl this year. So hopefully they don't have to worry about you know, taking a 15th 15th overall selection hopefully it's a 32nd overall selection all right yeah so that would be nice and with those playoff scenarios in order to win the super bowl like both of us are hoping the falcons will they have to first get into the playoffs and the falcons the easiest way into the playoffs right now is just win the division that can happen if the falcons beat carolina and tampa bay loses so they'll get that playoff berth with a win so it's good for the falcons there and the playoff picture as it stands, Dallas is the NFC's number one seed at 12 and two. Seattle with a 9-4 and one record is the number two seed. Atlanta at nine and five is the number three. 
Detroit at nine and five is the number four seed. The New York Giants at their nice now ten and five record after last night. They are the five seed in Green Bay and the sixth six slot at eight and six. So there's your NFC playoff picture. That game against Seattle when Richard Sherman held Julio Jones and the Falcons, if the penalty was called there, could have been put in a position to win. You know, that game is really starting to weigh pretty pretty big in this playoff picture. If Atlanta won that game, they'd be in the number two seed looking at a bye here. But instead, Seattle owns the tie break. They've also got one less loss that went to a game that they tied. So talk about that, Frankie. What do you think about all that? Well, you know, the Falcons can still get that bye. They need to win out. They need to go 11-5. and five. I don't see it happening. I think Seattle will also win out just because they played the Cardinals and the 49ers, I believe. I do think since the Seattle's 9-4-1 and one and Atlanta's 9-5, and five, I think the Falcons just have to win one, have to win both of theirs, and Seattle has to lose one of theirs. So the Seattle would end up 10-5-1, and five and one, and the Falcons would be 11-5. and five. I think that'll be it for the Falcons. I don't see it happening, but there's still the possibility that would be huge for the Falcons to win the NFC, giving them that bye that week off and not having to play Green Bay, which right now it's looking like the Falcons are going to play Green Bay and Atlanta again. Now, last time the Falcons played Green Bay, they won 33-32. to It was in the Georgia Dome as well. But here's why. Green Bay was missing Eddie Lacy, Clay Matthews, and Randall Cobb, and Aaron Rodgers was the leading rusher in that game. So Green Bay did not have nearly all of their tools, and the Falcons still kept that one close. Now, the Falcons are a much better team, but... Green Bay scares me right now, especially Aaron Rodgers in the playoffs. They beat the Falcons, I think it was 2011 or 2010, when the Falcons were the one seed. Green Bay came in here on their way to a Super Bowl run as the six seed. They're looking like they're going to be a six seed now. I don't want to play Green Bay. That number two slot would be huge if the Falcons could get that one. So the only place that's out of reach right now is the number one spot. Dallas clinched that one last night with the New York Giants loss. So... Two spot would be huge. Three spot, you better hope that Green Bay loses if I'm a Falcons fan. Yeah, Green Bay earlier this season when Aaron Rodgers wasn't doing well, the team itself was really not off to a great start. They were doing a nice job, but not a great job. Didn't look like they would be a playoff team this year until Aaron Rodgers just turns it on. He's been playing a phenomenal game these past few weeks, and it's just been nice for Green Bay to have Aaron Rodgers single-handedly taking over especially with their number one back Eddie Lacy being out now Lacy is on IR he will most likely be out for the rest of the season I think that's it for him but Ty Montgomery has started to show up as a running back even though he's got a wide receivers number for Green Bay and Christian Michael as well the running back that Green Bay picked up off of waivers from Seattle has now learned the playbook and is starting to break into the system so he's becoming a weapon in the run game, and now it's all starting to come together for Green Bay. They got Clay Matthews back. Their defense is starting to play like it really can, and they are a scary team. Their record doesn't say much about them. I think if they were playing like they are now the whole season, they'd probably be a 10 or 11 win team instead of an 8 and 6 team at this point. But yeah, they're a dangerous team. I see why you're scared of them there. So we'll move on. We'll talk about the Falcons and the amount of talent they have already at the Pro Bowl level right now. They have six Pro Bowlers. It's Julio Jones, Matt Ryan, Alex Mack, Matt Bryant, Vic Beasley, Devonta Freeman, and also the fullback Patrick DeMarco was named a first alternate. He has not touched the ball yet this year for the Falcons. Just named a first alternate Pro Bowl fullback because of his phenomenal job of blocking that he will always do. So, Frankie, there's six Pro Bowlers right now. Who do you think should be in the Pro Bowl next year, On maybe on top of these six guys? Well, those six guys and Patrick DeMarco, who possibly could make the Pro Bowl outright next year. And then along with that, just a couple of rookies. Keanu Neal, who's on, kind of borderline on this year's Pro Bowl, he should make it next year with a year of experience under him. I think that that will be huge for him. He's been a playmaker on defense. He's hard-hitting safety. A couple of times he's had some hard hits that made me grimace a little bit. And then Deion Jones, he had that pick six versus New Orleans earlier in the year. He might be the fastest linebacker in the NFL. Both of them are rising stars. I could see both of them in the Pro Bowl next year. 
And then Matt Ryan, one of the six pro bowlers for this year for the Atlanta Falcons, he is in the MVP conversation. So, Luke, do you think that he is a legitimate top three MVP candidate for this season? Yeah, I do think Matt Ryan is a legitimate top three MVP candidate, one of many pro bowlers the Falcons have had. Matt's been to the Pro Bowl several times, and this year has been, I guess you could say, his breakout year outside of his rookie season. He's really come out to play. Now, granted, he has better weapons than any quarterback in the NFL around him. So much speed and talent, especially the combination of it and so many guys. So Matt is a legitimate top three MVP candidate. And here's one of the ways that I look at it. This might be the biggest way is his two main opponents that are quarterbacks are Tom Brady and Derek Carr. I think if you take Tom Brady away from the Patriots, Jimmy Garoppolo, Jacoby Brissett can step up and take the team to pretty much the same place that they are now. They went 3-1 and one without Tom when he was suspended, so they don't need him. He's not necessarily the most valuable player in the league because his team has the ability to succeed without him. Again, that's a credit to Bill Belichick and his general manager up there in New England, but Moving over to Oakland with Derek Carr, I think if you take him out, it's it's going to be a pretty rough go for Oakland, but I don't I think they'll still survive and be a good team just because their offense has a lot of weapons like the Falcons do, and their defense is a lot better than that of the Atlanta Falcons, so they can hold up pretty well. Now Atlanta survives and thrives off of that offense, and the quarterback is the centerpiece of it. Matt Ryan's done a good job with this decision-making, play-calling, being an overall smart player, whatever he needs to be. And he's just so important to this team. I know they have a lot of weapons, but the Falcons might... I don't think they'd even be a 500 team without Matt Ryan because you'd have Matt Schaub as your backup. And I don't... He doesn't impress me enough to make this team an over 500 team, even though Schaub is a decent player, had a good career, but now he's toward the tail end of it. So with Matt Ryan, without him, I don't think the Falcons are very good. But now with him, they're in the playoff race looking for a bye week in the playoffs. So that's why I think Matt Ryan is a top three MVP candidate, because I think he is the best quarterback in the league in this 2016 season. And outside of that, maybe pick a couple other players to go with him in that top three. But Matt Ryan's definitely up there in my book. All right, so we're going to move on to the Falcons versus Panthers preview. But before we do that, we're going to just mention the power rankings. Now, most of these websites put out their power rankings each week, and they reflect on how that team has done recently. So it's based on both the whole season and the recent trend. The Falcons have been pretty hot, scoring 40 points in each of their last two games. So that's why Fox Sports has them at number 3, ESPN at number 5, Yahoo Sports at number 6, Bleacher Report puts them at number 5, SB Nation at number 3, and NFL.com at number 8. So those numbers don't reflect a lot, but it does reflect that the Falcons have been doing pretty well the past few weeks. Yeah, the Falcons have had some nice games like you mentioned. I think they're right where they need to be in that 3-8 to eight range. I think three is a good spot for them. I think that their offense is just so unstoppable that a lot of teams are going to have a very, you know, they're just not going to have an easy time beating Atlanta. So I think that's a good spot. Number five is solid. I think NFL.com putting them in number eight reflects the absolute lack of disrespect the national media has for Atlanta sports. But that's okay. We'll just go into Super Bowl and prove them all wrong. Okay. So let's preview the Falcons and Panthers game. We'll start off with the record. Falcons, as we mentioned earlier, are 9-5, and five, playing at the Panthers, who are 6-8. and eight. Both teams come in pretty hot on two-game win streaks. So it's going to be a pretty fairly matched game, even though the records are a little bit different. And the Panthers have gotten better all year long. Earlier in the season, the Falcons offensively annihilated the Panthers. Julio Jones had over 300 yards receiving. Matt Ryan threw for over 500 yards. Falcons scored 48 points. Carolina scored 33 points, but the game wasn't quite as close as the score might show. Falcons had them beat the whole way. But you know, this year, the Falcons hope to clinch a playoff spot. They're on the road in Carolina. And about one year exactly from here, from this week's game, the Falcons were hosting the Panthers, who were 15-0. and or 14-0 and trying to pull off a perfect season, 
while the Falcons are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, and the Falcons pulled off the upset. So that's the one thing the Falcons have to be careful about this year, is that the Panthers are going to try to spoil their season. Yeah, the Falcons cannot let the Panthers turn the table there. Like you said, they're in opposite places that they were in last year. Now that the Panthers are pretty much eliminated, they're going to be playing without Luke Keekley. I think we were talking about that earlier and how Keekley is such a big-time player and a great linebacker, but he won't be playing. He's out with that concussion protocol, and the Falcons, again, they're trying to clinch a playoff spot riding that offense. I think Carolina, without a key piece in their defense, is going to have a tough time handling that offense, especially the speed of it. They're going to miss Luke Keekley. A lot of parts because of his smarts and his brain, which is why he's actually out right now. And Carolina, like I think you were talking about, they found new life. They've defensively improved. And the way that team works, when their pass rush is good, their defense overall is good. It makes their defensive backs better because they don't have to cover as long. Right. And the linebackers also a little bit better as well. And is their you know their pass rush wasn't great at the start of the season so that's why they gave up so many points to Atlanta and some other teams but now that their pass rush has improved their defense improved and overall their team has improved so they've been able to go on a two game win streak and their offense has struggled with consistency but again Cam Newton is a stellar stellar player great athlete they have Jonathan Stewart who I don't believe they had in the first matchup between these two teams Kelvin Benjamin has had more time to come off that injury he had. And now their team is starting to come into its own. Their offensive line is still a bit of a mess. So Vic Beasley may be able to sneak in there and get some more sacks as he does lead the NFL in sacks. So that matchup is going to be very interesting between the two teams. But Carolina has the ability and the firepower to come back and the Falcons just have to be wary of it. And you mentioned Vic Beasley and the rest of the Falcons. They might be able to feast on Cam Newton and the Carolina offensive line, which isn't quite as put together as it would have liked to be at this point in the season. But Cam Newton's been creating a little bit of stir in the media recently about you know being hit unfairly and not getting penalties called against him just because of his size. Now, Vic Beasley is a pretty big guy, and so is Cam Newton, so... That'll be an interesting matchup, but do you think that the officials really are being unfair to Cam Newton? Yeah, to be honest with you, Cam Newton is the size of the guys trying to tackle him a lot of times. He's about the size of a linebacker being 6'4", 6'5", in that range, and he's a big dude, and a lot of times the referees are not going to call the late hits and maybe the hard hits or roughing the passer just because Cam is so big, and maybe it's harder for the referees to tell that it is a penalty, but... Things like that. I think a lot of times referees are trying to call it like they see it, and they just may not be seeing it like they would with maybe a Peyton Manning back there, like an older dude that they have to protect. Newton does have a lot of firepower. He's a superstar, the face of an NFL franchise that's been pretty good in the past two or three seasons. And they have to protect him. Referees have to really keep doing their job. But I think maybe watch out a little bit more with Cam just because he will get those unnecessary hits and they're going to have to call it. Now, I don't mind the referees not calling it. It makes it easier on us Falcon fans if Cam Newton is banged up or not playing. But yeah, I think to be honest with you, he is treated unfairly as a quarterback and the referees might have to keep more of an eye on him just so that he doesn't get hurt because that can cripple the entire Carolina Panthers franchise if he were to get hurt. All right, so that brings us to the end of our show. Again, thank you for listening to the Atlanta Sports Podcast. You can find us on our website, atlantasportspodcast.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there. We'd appreciate that. And you can stay up to date on all of our latest podcasts and our latest blog posts. You can also follow us on Twitter, at ATL Sportscast. And you can find us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, pretty much all the major directories. We would ask that you subscribe to us and any of those major directories and also leave us a review there as well and we'll hope to see you next week with another show